Thank you for joining us this afternoon. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Tip Cronin, and I'm Vice President of Advancement at the American College. I've been with the college 15 years now, so I've collaborated and worked, I'm sure, with many of you that are in attendance today. It's my privilege to welcome you to this afternoon's Alumni Association Knowledge and Network event on behalf of the American College and uh, also representing a dear friend of mine, today's speaker, Joe Jordan. Today's program is brought to you free by the American College of Financial Services Alumni Association and by Joe, who we would especially like to thank for taking his valuable time to be with us today. Thank you, Joe. Okay, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's guest of honor. Joe Jordan is an inspirational speaker and behavioral finance expert, having presented to more than 400,000 financial professionals in 28 countries, and is the author of the best selling book, Living a Life of Significance. Formerly, Joe ran insurance sales at Payne Weber, and more recently was a senior vice president at MetLife. For three consecutive years, Joe's been honored by Irish American Magazine as one of the top 50 Irish Americans on Wall Street. Joe and I first met, Joe, it's hard to believe, back in the mid 90s. So I've had the honor of knowing you for at least 25 years. So with all that said, Joe, welcome, thank you, and the platform is yours, sir. Well, thank you, Tip. Can everybody hear me okay? You're hearing me, Tip? Yes. Okay, great. Hey, uh, uh, it's really an honor to be speaking with all of you here today, and I wanna thank my good friend, Tip Cronin, who made this possible. And you know, I gotta tell you, he's a very smooth guy, you know, because he said, Joe, do you believe in free speech? I said, yeah. He said, well, you're going to give one. No, all, all, all kidding aside, it's my pleasure to do, uh, to do this, um, given my 12-year affiliation with the college. And I think the college is needed now more than ever. And I'm really impressed with what George has done with the, in his tenure. Given the importance of our profession to society, uh, the, the college's goals are very much in sync or in concert with hopefully my message. How, uh, so anyway. Uh, let me tell you what my goal is today. My goal is to take this business from your head to your heart, to demonstrate the unbelievable opportunity that is before you, okay? But boy, before I get started, how the world has changed, huh? Catch my story, okay? And on, on March 2nd, I did a speech in, in South Africa. March 6th, it was New Zealand. March 10th, I was in the White House. A good friend of mine, General Jack Keen, got the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and he invited my wife and I to be there. And the next day, March 11th, I was cooped up in my apartment, ground zero in Manhattan for, for the virus. But you know what? I have to tell you something. I was, I was grateful that I was able to complete my around-the-world trip, perhaps going to my first and probably last uh, introduction to the White, uh, invitation to the White House. And this is what it's important about. I think a positive mental mindset is critical in this environment. And one of the best ways to promote a positive attitude is to be in the state of gratitude. In times like this, it's easy to get caught up in negative thinking or feeling bad about yourself. The key to staying focused and productive is to stay optimistic. And being an optimist in times like this is very rare. And optimists are not Pollyannas. They believe that there are serious problems in the world, but they believe that they are solvable. And there's no better way to stay optimistic than to be grateful. Now, gratitude is a choice. It's not a skill. So that means you can start doing it tomorrow. So what you should be grateful for, be grateful for your family and community, and here's hoping that all of them are safe and healthy. Be grateful you're in this country and have a career that helps people when they need it most. Look, health is not just the absence of disease, it's a sense of overall well-being. And knowing you're protected contributes to your overall feeling of well-being. Now, other professions, look, uh, medicine might deal with the extension of life, but you guys deal with the quality and dignity of life. 
uh, be grateful for the benefits, death benefits, DI claims, living benefits on life policies, paid out or on standby. By the way, do you guys know how much benefit you've created? You know, everyone knows their comp. Everyone knows whether they're going on the trip to Bermuda. But have you ever sat down and take a look at the face amount or some of the benefits you've created through other protection products? This is a true story. We had a guy in Pennsylvania at MetLife. He was a young guy, Philadelphia, and he was a young guy and he wanted to quit because he said, I'm sick of the way I get treated. I don't like prospecting and went on and on and on. And then finally, he called me up one day and says, Joe, I read your book. And you know what I realized for the first time? That if all my clients died last night in Philadelphia, that Philadelphia would receive more revenue if it hosted the Super Bowl. Just in his life insurance alone, he had $1.8 billion of life insurance in force. So when you change the way you see things, the things you see change. So I, I want to be sure that you do that. Uh, be grateful for the advancements in technology. Can you imagine if this thing happened three years ago? So many different companies have been working on the idea of doing things on a virtual basis. And, you know, if it was three years ago, it would be problematic. And when all of this is over, think of how much more the new skills you've acquired and how much more efficient you'll be with virtual tools. Look at me. I never did a webinar in my life until April. and Now I've done about 70 of them. And this is important. Remember this, different is not always better, but better is always different. So let me tell you about my gratitude experience. When I got back from the White House, I got a call and this guy tells me, he heard me speak six years ago. He said I changed his life uh, and he was attributing a lot of his success to me. Now I've gotten calls like this before, but this was different. This guy does a thing called Gratitude Fridays. Every Friday he calls someone up who had an impact on his life and let him know about it. It blew my mind. I felt great. He felt great. And so what I'm getting across to you is this is something that can also help a positive mental attitude is to share gratitude with someone who's had an impact on you. Don't wait till Friday. Write about do six weeks in advance. Let me tell you something. You want to blow out the cobwebs in your head and feel good about yourself and good about the people that's there. Share some gratitude. I think I think it, it, it really makes a lot of sense. Look, in a year, you will have spoken to 52 people. And, you know, two years ago wasn't the end of a year. It was the end of a decade. A decade is 520 people. So this is important when you are grateful. Fear disappears and abundance appears. And no negative emotion can stand up to gratitude. So look, I think it makes sense that I, but we focus on the three external drivers of change that have happened well before this virus hit. And there's three fundamental drivers of change. There's technology, regulation, and demographics. Next slide. The first one is the six Ds of exponential. That's, this is, this is um, uh, uh, technology. First is digitized. If you digitize something, it means it can be uh, uh, manipulated by a computer. The next one is deceptive. Usually it starts off small, so big industries and, 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 and companies don't see it until it becomes disruptive. Sometimes it's too late. Then it dematerializes. Think of all of the things you don't need because you have an iPhone. Then it demonetizes you. There's nothing to sell. And then it democratizes, which means some guy in the jungles of Brazil has access to the same information that you have. Next slide. Uh, Wall Street, this is from the Wall Street Journal, and this is something really that people who work for like State Farm or Allstate are really grappling with. How do you insure a driverless car? This is how technology can be really disruptive. And I know those companies and others are also trying to spread out to also do more financial planning. The next slide, uh, in our own business, we wound up with these guys, robo-advisors. They came out very aggressive. They had business to consumer business models. They said, we're gonna clean your clock. All of the research we do, we've got it. We can throw all, show all that stuff on the phone. We're low cost and what have you. They failed miserably. And now most of these robo-advisors are partnering with face-to-face -face distribution. Why? One of them says it's very expensive to create a brand. And how do you like this one? How do you create trust and relationships? From my standpoint, I say, welcome to the NFL. So having said that, the guy who's the biggest disruptor in the world, next slide, is this guy Bezos, right? And he says, everyone's asking me what's going to change in the next 10 years. He said, I'm less concerned about what's going to change. I'm more concerned about what doesn't change. Because if it doesn't change, you can build a business model around it. So guess what? Next slide. When people have to make a financial decision 
and it's complicated and the penalty for getting it wrong is high, they actually want to talk to a person. Next slide. You're now looking at the person who won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2017, Thaler, the father of behavioral finance. What he basically proved was that people don't use logic when they make financial decisions. You know that, but nobody else seems to know that. On top of that, he's also quoted as saying, economics would be a great science if it only dealt with the way people actually behave versus the way that they're supposed to behave. Now, these are things that are happening kind of outside of our business, but is really directing us. And that's why I think that, that, that you should be optimistic about the future. Now, having said that, we experienced the fastest the market went down from an all-time high. On March 23rd, just 33 days from the peak, the S&P closed down 34% at 2,237. This decline is without historical precedent. Then, then the next 50 days, it goes up higher and quicker than it ever has done before. No analyst, no commentator, no reporter, no expert saw this coming. So how do you expect civilians to deal with this without having an advisor there? So what should you do about this? Don't waste this crisis, all right? Don't waste it. Uh, I, in my 46 years that I've been in the business, I lived through the the high inflation of the 70s, the high interest rates of the early 80s, the near bear market of 98, the dot com crash of double lot, 9 11, the crash of uh, the near crab. Uh, uh, the, the near bear market of 2011 and the Christmas Eve massacre of 2018. All of these incidents, with the exception of 9-11, were primarily financial crisis. This current crisis also brings the fear of death and disability. For the first time in my 46 years in this business, we have something new. It's called demand. Google search traffic for life insurance jumped 50% between March and April. Limer reported 29% of consumers say they are most likely to buy life, most likely to buy life insurance in the next 12 months because of COVID-19. That means 75 million people. Well, you know the saying, right? Disturb the comfortable and, and comfort the disturbed. Guess what? They're already disturbed. Now, look, I'm a firm believer in the future, that the future belongs to KYC, which is know your customer. Planning and develop jointly a goal-oriented plan which dictates future behavior. The days of product centricity and transactional relationships are over. However, I would point out that it's been my experience that financial planning culture focuses on retirement, leaving little room for protection products or risk management. Couple that with the longest bull market in history, a decade, it's easy to see how risk management can get pushed back. But make no mistake about it, the push to develop holistic plans that solve multiple solutions is being driven by consumers, not regulators. Right now, the consumer is very attuned to his or her mortality. So it's time to step up and, and take the holistic approach. The other thing, there's no case on record where someone on their deathbed said, call my broker. I really appreciate he or she beat the S&P by two basis points. It just doesn't happen. In fact, if you morph totally into just wealth management, that business can be tough. You know that people feel losses twice, two times more than they feel gains. And despite having a good track record, they always know someone who's done better. Like this lunatic thing that happened yesterday with that, that stock that went up a thousand percent, all right? But if you deliver a death claim or a life product you have, you're responsible for as a living benefit that pays some medical bills, or they have a long-term care incident or a disability incident, people are far more appreciative. See, when you change the way you see things, the things you see change. Now, I've had a very varied career in financial services. I was a life agent. I ran insurance sales at Payne Weber. I built the annuity business at MetLife, and later I had all retail product development and started fee-based financial planning. This background gave me a very broad insight into financial services. And frankly, I didn't like what I saw. I began to observe that we were not as client-centric as other industries. I felt there would be consequences, and there were and there are. And I was concerned about this. And then I came across a Gallup survey focusing on the ethics and believability of different professions. The only ones that were beneath us were Congress and car salesmen. Do you know what the number one profession was? It's nurses. And I bet you that's still operative today. 
the other ones, just under nurses, were all service organizations. And service professionals are built on two foundations, humility and maturity. And humble people don't think less of themselves. They just think of themselves less. And mature people are not necessarily older. They see things from another person's perspective, which means they took the time to find out what that perspective was. That's why I believe holistic planning is far more client-centric. I believe that financial services needs to evolve from a sales culture to a service culture, something that the college can really help us with. All, uh, and so I think that's important. As a result of that, I wrote a book, Living a Life of Significance. Uh, this, you, you could, you have the slide there. By the way, the first edition, we actually, the American College had published it, and all of the proceeds went to the American College, which is something I'm very proud of. I won't tell you how much, but it was a lot. But anyway, the whole idea about, uh, uh, and it's in five languages, by the way. It's in English, uh, Japanese, Chinese, Spanish, and Portuguese. And I do this not just because I do stuff overseas. It's the changing face of America. And you really should start beginning to think about that as the changing face happens, because there's a lot, great deal of opportunity out there. And all it was is a simple compilation of stories about the lives uh, uh, <clears throat> of financial professionals and how they affected the lives of their clients. Something I don't think we do enough of. And as we said, oh, and we sold about 125,000 of them. So anyway, whenever I speak, next slide, okay. Um, whenever I speak uh, uh, in front of an audience, I always ask everyone, um, who here wants to live a significant life? Of course, everybody puts their hands on it. If you were there, if I could see you, you probably have your hand up, or I hope you do. <clears throat> Living a significant life is built on four pillars. It's belonging, purpose, storytelling and transcendence, belonging. With the secularization of society, the rise of social media and the decline of religion and family values, people have never felt more isolated and alone. Yale did a study and found out the more people use Facebook, the worse they feel. No one posts that they had a bad day or the car blew up or the dog died. No, it's all this idyllic stuff that everyone knows is bull anyway. And it has produced something else. It's called FOMO, which is the fear of missing out which means some people validate themselves by what other people say about them. Do you know that the UK has the Ministry of, uh, has, has the ministry of Loneliness? Excuse me. It's for real. It's a, it's a cabinet position. I almost said it. This is not John Cleese and the Ministry of Silly Walks, all right? This is a real legitimate program. Uh, and the other thing is to know this, is that the number one course in Stanford Business School is creating relationships. Look, it's others that give our lives meaning and purpose by providing community and connection. Dan Butner, who works for the uh, for, for National Geographic, who studies different cultures that, that live long, he says this, he says, isolation kills. 15 years ago, the average American had close to had three close friends. Now it's down to one and a half. People are craving relationships. That works in our favor. The next, the next pillar is purpose, and purpose requires a commitment that's greater than what's in it for you. Hey, I heard a great definition of purpose, and I heard it at MDRT. Little commercial. Validate and go to MDRT. Don't tell me you outgrew it. It's one of the things you need to do to understand the great program, the great industry that you happen to be with. They have tens of thousands of people there from all over the world who do what you do. So anyway, let me tell you this definition. Purpose is not the thing you do. It's the thing that happens inside of others when you do what you do. Notice the emphasis on others. And purpose is different from goals. Goals are important, but goals are things that you want to obtain. I want a new house. I want a car. I want certain recognition. All of those things are great, and those are goals that you want to obtain. But purpose is different because purpose is that which you want to attain. A way to look at the difference is to simply take a shot at your eulogy. What is it you want to be remembered for? Not that he or she had a great pair of shoes or did you see the clothes they had or the house they had. No, you want to be remembered for something that's more important. You, you want to make certain that, that people know that. And you see, this is something you have to understand. 
I think, okay, some people think that their purpose in life is to find meaning in life. I don't think that's what we seek. I think what we seek is to experience being alive. And there's no better way to experience being alive than in the service of others. Viktor Frankl in his world famous book, Man's Search for Meaning, and this guy lived through a Nazi concentration camp, okay, so he knows from what he speaks. He said this, he said, significance cannot be pursued, it must ensue. And it can only do so as the unintended side effect of one's devotion to a cause greater than oneself or of the byproduct of one's surrender to someone other than oneself. You can't live a significant life unless you benefit others and you do it, you do it for, and you do it for a living. And so what about now your value proposition, okay? The value of the advice you provide and the products you sell is worth far more than what your clients pay for it. Price is only an issue in the absence of value. And let's explore your value. I think you represent intrinsic value. And intrinsic value is not measured by how much money you make, but by the size of the problem that you can solve. And you tell me a profession that solves problems bigger than this. You protect the innocent if someone dies prematurely so that they have peace of mind. You can provide people with a worry-free retirement with an income they can't outlive so that they can maintain their independence. You protect that income if they get sick so that they can maintain their dignity. Finally, you provide legacy when they die. Tell me a profession that does more than that. But you got to not only know it, you got to believe it because your beliefs, your beliefs drive your behavior. And if your desires, and what I mean by your desires are your goals, if your desires don't sync with your beliefs, you're always going to manifest your beliefs. And deep down inside, if you don't believe that you do something worthwhile, and a lot of people do and get in this business, and they succeed, but I submit that they could be subject to something I know nobody talks about in financial services, and that's low self-esteem. Carter Woodson said, if you can determine what a person thinks, you don't have to worry about what they will do, because if they assume a low position in life, you don't have to urge them to take a low position in life because they'll get there all by themselves. If you can make someone feel like an outcast, you don't have to ask them to get up and go out the back door. They'll get up and do it on their own. And if there is no back door, their very nature will demand one. All chronic production issues are behavioral, your behavior. Therefore, you have to deal with it. And so I'm going to give you some... Uh, some advice on that, okay? Now, the third, the third pillar is storytelling. And storytelling emphasizes the impact we have on others. All wisdom comes from specific human experiences. And stories create, a, a, a tr create trust and a biological bond that no robo-advisor can do. Stories provide a vicarious experience, which has the ability to change people's perspectives. Stories are memorable. In my experience, I bump into people heard me speak 10 years ago. They all remember the stories. They don't remember the other stuff. Look, people feel first and they rationalize later. Statistics and numbers play a supporting role, not a leading one. Unfortunately, much of financial planning culture focuses on the technical. When talking to somebody, don't say, hey, what do you think of this? Ask them how they feel about it. And people don't buy products, they buy hope, they buy freedom, they buy status, they buy independence, they buy security, they buy peace of mind, they buy stability and simplicity in financial affairs. They're all intangibles, and yet we speak all the time about the hard numbers. The other tool we need to master is the metaphor. And the definition of a metaphor is a thing regarded as represented or symbolic of something else, especially abstract. And the person who perfected the use of the metaphor in financial services is Warren Buffett. Once he was asked about the risk of investing during a bull market, he said a rising tide raises all boats, but when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. You don't have to have a PhD in economics to figure it out. And, 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 and this is something else about it. Think about it. It's a little funny, right? Humor and, and stress cannot exist at the same time. And sometimes we put our clients in a lot of stress. So understanding and, and mastering metaphors are important. Uh, next slide. I feel so strongly about stories that if you click on this link, I will send you two stories a month free for six months. Uh, my goal is twofold. One, first, it will reinforce the fact that you live a significant life and the stories are dynamite and you can use them with clients. 
uh, uh, and, and helps you celebrate your impact on others. The second is could increase the number of stories that you have in your arsenal. So if you see the link up here, you can uh, you can order it. So it's josephjordan.com slash story. And I'm going to pause for a second because I know what's going on. That's a great idea. I got to do it. I'll do it later. Don't do it later. Do it now. At least write it down now. Because if you don't do it right now, you ain't going to do it right now. I want you to do it right now. So we're going to pause a little bit so you can take a look at the link and do that because then you'll be reminded. And by the way, don't fall into the trap. Someone said, I heard all the stories. They don't change the Lord's prayer for Christ's sake, okay? The thing is designed to get you back into the right frame of mind. Next slide, okay? So um, the other thing is I have, I have my Life of Significance bundle. It's my book, and I have two audio video programs. One of them is Life of Significance, a woman's perspective. I'm a big fan of feminizing the business, folks. I got to tell you, why? If creating trust in relationships is crucial, Women do that instinctively, so it's a business reason. It's not for being fair or balanced or all of the other stuff that you hear in these days. It's a hard business decision. It's 13 vignettes from 12 women talking about their impact on clients. The other one is life of significance when business becomes personal, all about small businesses and how you can deal with it. I never went to see a small business because I was afraid of the accountant and lawyer. It's all about stories, and I have my book. It usually retails for 124 you can get it for a hundred bucks if you're interested. Next slide, okay? And the last slide is transcendence. And transcendence is that out of body experience you get when you've done something worthwhile for someone else. So look, during all periods of uncertainty, yeah, I think you have two goals. One, you have to contact your existing clients and you have to take their temperature. And uh, you see people like to be at, like being asked, they feel, uh, they like to talk about themselves and people feel more important because you ask them and even good clients get really concerned and nervous. So you'll hear things like, Hey, I think the market will crash. I'll lose all my money. I don't like these new people in the government. Um, uh, I think I'm going to be alive and broke or whatever disaster du jour is on their mind at the time. Don't at this point, give them some historical correct facts that in your mind assuages their fear. It's impossible. It's impossible to reason with fear. What you need to do is help them validate their concern by asking them, hey, that's a very natural concern and I certainly appreciate it, but how would you see this happening? And then shut up. This should give them you some idea of what they're thinking about. By the way, if they mention Bernie Madoff, you know you're the problem and it's time to get rid of them because they don't trust you. But you know, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that, uh, and the prognosis for that client really isn't that good. However, if they have normal concerns and they feel better, they got it, they'll feel better, they got it off their chest. You can review their, their plan, which contains their goals and objectives. This gives them, this, this gets them focusing back on their goals. And you may have, they may have forgotten that some of the products you use to fund their plan has helps to assuage some of the, some of the, the fears they have of market volatility or whatever, okay? Also, Think of all of the clients who've been abandoned by their advisor. Did you know that a recent J.D. Power study claims this, is that two-thirds of American public uses a financial advisor. One-third of that group has not heard from their advisor since the pandemic started. And, uh, and that does not include the one-third that doesn't have an advisor. So what should you do? As I said, don't waste this crisis. The business is built on two foundations prospecting and everything else that's not a joke it's for real you look every meeting you go to everyone assumes you're in front of people isn't that the biggest challenge you've got is how you're going to get in front of these people and how you're going to face the rejection to get through that that's why you have to fundamentally know that you do something that's worthwhile i believe that because if you do that you can overcome that fear and make that happen it doesn't matter if you know everything, if you stop prospecting. And one of the great prospecting techniques I'm a big fan of, next slide, is this uh, is what I call the DCC or daily contact commitment. It's simple. You make a, co a commitment to contact X number of people a day, every day, business days. I didn't make this up. My manager made me do it back in 1974. His told me I had to contact 10 people a day. I didn't know I couldn't do it, so I did. What's different about this is, listen to me, you're managing to effort and not results. 
You're managing to effort and not results. You don't control your results. You don't control whether someone sees you. You don't control whether someone buys from you. You don't control interest rates, the stock market, or the straits of hard moves. You, uh, you, you know, you only control your effort. And look, it's one of these things that, you know, I don't like to get on the phone and call, but if I do it and then I, you know, it's like when I used to play football, you know, you, you, you after your first hit, you know, then you're, then you're going. So it just, it, it just makes certain that you don't drag out the, you know, the feeling, the feeling that, that, that you, that you have. Uh, so, um, uh, here's something else. If I had 10 no's, I had a successful day. Why? It's because I faced my fears. It's something that I was under control with. And I did something positive I controlled. So look, if we invest in people the power to approve us, we also give them the power to disapprove us. So that's why you have to do it with the game of numbers. And the more you prospect, the better you feel. The better you feel, the more you prospect. And look, I don't think this is just something you do. I think it's a reaffirmation of faith. Faith that you do something worthwhile. And St. Augustine said that faith is believing in what you can't see. And when you have faith, you can begin to see what you believe. I believe that knowing you labor for a higher purpose will raise your pain tolerance and commitment to continue to prospect. The daily contact commitment is just a way to do it. Because here's the point. The business is built on three variables. The quality of your work, the number of people you show your work to, and the, the reaction or non-reaction from people you show your work to. You control the first two, you have absolutely no control over the third. You can only help people who wanna be helped. You can only help people who wanna be helped by you, and you can only help people who wanna be helped by you now. So sometimes even with your best effort, you just have to say, next. That's why the business is built on, on prospecting and everything else. Bottom line, you can always learn by doing, but we never do by learning. You will not learn your way to the top of the profession. You will behave your way to the top. So we find ourselves in one of two behaviors, prospecting or avoiding prospecting. What force blocks us? It's fear. It's not bad to feel fear, but it's bad to do what fear tells us what to do. Funny thing about fear, it does not exist in the real world. It's in, it's in our minds and it's an emotion. And you don't fight an emotion with logic. You fight it with the other big emotion, and that is love. And 1 John 4 says there is no fear in love. And total love drives out fear. And the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. You simply can't be indifferent and be in this business. If you're indifferent, then you might as well just jump on with the robos, right? When you change the way you see things, the things you see change. The best I can tell, the driving force of consumer-driven change since I've been in the business, away from buying products in a transactional relationship uh, to, to having a, a plan and advisory relationship uh, uh, is this. Next slide. Clients need a plan. All successful investing is goal-oriented and planning-driven. All unsuccessful investing is market-focused and investment-driven. Uh, the next thing, clients need a partner. That's you. And a partner encourages clients to subordinate their short-term emotional impulses to their long-term financial goals. That's why you got to know what the goals are, all right? Uh, perhaps the greatest be benefit. Uh, oh, and advisors need a plan. Excuse me. A plan justifies your recommendations in the best interest environment. Perhaps the, best, the greatest benefit of a well-designed plan and a trusted advisor was best articulated from a client who said, my plan and my advisor saved me from myself. And a great example of this is, uh, next slide. Um, uh, we, uh, this slide shows the impact of timely advice and how it can, be multi can provide multiples of, of value to your clients. We are, of course, in a, challenge, in a challenged environment today. But the last real bear market we had was back in 07, 09. And my light is burning out here, so I'm just going to replace it. There we go. Okay. Now I'm bright and shiny. Okay. So um, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the last real bull mark, bear market we had, excuse me, was 07, 09. Uh, that's when we had a peak in a trough. But we had three near misses. All right. So in 1998, the market went down 1999, 98, excuse me. We experienced a decline of 19.3. Remember, it's a 20% decline from a previous high. 19.3 is pretty close, and the market trough was 957. 
In 2011, the decline was 19.4, when the market trough was 1099. Then in 2018, the Christmas Eve massacre, okay, the decline was as close as you can get to a bear market, 19.8, and the trough was 2351. By the way, the S&P is now bouncing around 3,700 right now. Uh, you notice a pattern here? Left to their own devices, many people would panic out during one or all of these things. Buy, low, buy high and sell low doesn't work. But it also proves something else. A well-timed intervention can be worth a decade's worth of fees. Everyone's obsessed with fees. You know, if you were invested in this thing and you had this fee versus that fee, you'd have a lot more money. That means if you stayed in, for Christ's sake, that's where you earn your money. When people are about panicked, when they're standing on the windowsill, they're going to jump out the window. They say, get me out. I can't take it anymore. You have to learn the three most important words in financial services. And that's to say, don't do that. It's the idea of keeping them on target. And it's really worth the 100 basis points or whatever you're charging for it. The other people are just mathematicians and they probably have all their money in CDs who are saying that, uh, uh, who are, who are saying that, that, that anyway. So it's not about the math, it's about the consequences of the decision. And it's all about managing behavior. That's how you make, make uh, that's how you, you make a living. Next slide. So if I'm telling you guys you do something worthwhile, what's the defining issue of the 21st century? Okay. Uh, it's not any of these three. It's the next one. It's the aging population of the world. All right. Catch this. There will be 2 billion people on the planet by 2050 over the age of 60. There will be five countries with over 50 million people over the age of 60. China, India, United States, Indonesia, and Brazil. Japan will lose 18% of its population by 2050. They lose half their population by the end of the century. China will get old before it gets rich. By 2050, China will have more people over 60 than the entire population of Japan, UK, France, and Germany combined. China has 30 million bachelors. I don't have to go into detail as to why that is. They had a one-child policy. How do you recover from that? They have, they have, they have kids out there that have no they have they have no aunts and uncles and they have no no siblings. You know, how does a society overcome that? Um, and the real issue is the working age population. See, Japan will lose 28 percent of its working age population by age by 2050. South Korea 24, and China will lose 21 percent. That's 200 million people. It's bigger than the population of Brazil. The United States is in better shape, but we do have some issues. In 1935, when Social Security started, we had 42 workers for every retiree. Now it's three. By 2030, it will be two workers. So here's the new challenges that people face. Next slide. Uh, they're going to wind up without a pension plan. They're going to have a bag of cash, and they're going to have to turn assets into income. They don't know how to do that. They're going to have to manage money, manage risk, not just money, and they're going to have to make the most of what they got. So uh, next slide. So what is the biggest asset? Okay. Uh, oh, rather, the, the change of change of consumer focus. ROI used to mean return on investment. Now it's the reliability of the income, turning assets into income. Next slide. So. Um, What's the biggest asset that the average American has? Not everyone, but the average American. Well, it happens to be Social Security. And next slide. So if someone in this category, an average person, takes Social Security at age 62, they wind up getting $18,000 a year. But just by waiting to their normal retirement age of 67, they get $28,000 a year. Just by waiting, they get substantially more. Um, you ask someone, can you live on $18,000 a year? And of course, they're going to say no. But it's the wrong question. How much would you have to set aside on your own to give you $18,000 a year, uh, uh, increasing it by 3% a year for inflation? Don't ask me. Go to Fidelity. They say multiply the number by 25. If you multiply that by 25, you need $450,000. How many people have $200,000 in their 401k and they think they're done? The fact of the matter is they don't know how to turn assets into income. Just by waiting to $28,000 a year, you multiply that by 25, 25, it's 701. That's a quarter of a million dollar spread, all right? In fact, if you think about it, 
if someone delays Social Security from 62 to age 70, the increase in income is about 76% for as long as you live, and it gets primarily driven by mortality credits and not the capital markets, and we're going to talk about that uh, in a minute. So how can Social Security pay older people more? Well, it's very simple. Actuaries know mathematically how many people will die in a given year at any age. They don't know who's going to die, but they know how many. Next slide. Um, they also know uh, the number of deaths that will occur, OK? So if you're taking a look at, uh, at this, this slide of mortality credits, OK, if you start with 100 people at age 65, uh, by age 70, there's 91. By age 75, there's 79. They don't know who's dying, but they know that's what the number is. Next slide. At age 80, it's 63. So they know that they are not going to be paying uh, everybody the same dollar amount. And that's still, at age 80, it's still more than half, okay? So having said that, uh, next slide. Um, there are three financial programs, okay, that, uh, that, that pay older people more. It's Social Security, pension plans, and immediate annuities. And uh, that's a good way to make that analogy when you're doing, when you're doing this. Uh, oh, I see this thing is moving over there. There we go, okay? Um, I'm sorry if that was bothering you. <clears throat> uh, immediate annuities, and I'll get to that in a minute. So some people ask, are immediate, are interest rates too low for SBIAs? Next, next, uh, next slide. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is at age 70, you can get five and a quarter percent. People would kill to find a CD that pays that. At age 80, it's 9% because the older people get, the more it's driven by mortality credit, and it's a hedge against the capital markets risk that you have. And then the next slide is how much does the underlying interest contribute to annuity payouts? Uh, if you take a look at this slide by age 80, it's 15%. The biggest risk you have with the median annuities is if life expectancy changes. So the fact of the matter is interest rates for older people, interest rates are, le are, are less of an, of, of, of an impact. Look, immediate annuities work just like Social Security, paying older people more income. Immediate annuities provide more certainty in retirement. By offering guaranteed lifetime income without market loss, they are designed for a portion of your client's assets, and they provide immediate, stable, predictable, income that lasts as long as you as they live. They also can be designed to continue income after the death of the first annuitant, like a spouse, a spouse or anyone else. One of the biggest champions for immediate annuities, next slide, um, is this guy, okay, Voltaire. And uh, Voltaire was a, as a philosopher, as you know, next slide. And uh, when he was in his 60s, he, he said this, <clears throat> he didn't know he was gonna live into his 80s. He said, I advise you to go on living solely to engage, enrage those who are paying your annuity. It's the only pleasure I have left. It's the way that an older person can stick it to the man, all right? So next slide. So let's get into the six, the six <clears throat> risks that people have in retirement. Uh, longevity, living too long. That's why we talk about the idea of delaying Social Security, just again to remind you that if they possibly can do it, if they go to age 70, they're going to wind up with 76% more and uh, <clears throat> from, 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 from age 62 to age 70. And, uh, uh, and that's for the rest of your life. Um, <clears throat> next slide, the risks. Uh, uh, the other thing is that uh, it talks about volatility. I did the research and what we found out is that the stock market goes up and down. It's true, it does. And so do interest rates. So that's what happens with capital markets. They tend to go up and down. So that's why sometimes people want to protect themselves from some of that, some of that, that volatility, if you would. All right. Um, next slide. Um, withdrawal rates risk. They don't know how much to take out. So, you know, they have a bag of cash and so they don't know how long they're going to live. So that means how much do I take out? Do I take out uh, too little and then I don't get the benefit of it? Or do I take out too much and I'm, I wind up being broke? So this slide talks about the idea of uh, withdrawal rate risk. Or, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this, this comes from, uh, this is actually an article Wade Fowl was in. And he talked about the 4%, 4% rule. When I first heard the 4% rule, I said, you got to be kidding me, 40,000 for a million bucks? Now, Wade Fowles says it's three. It's three percent. It's thirty thousand per million dollars. 
you know, that's a lot means someone's got to save an awful, uh, you know, an awful lot. So you have to really watch the withdrawal rate process and especially dealing with volatile markets. Next slide. The other one is this, this thing called sequence of returns. Next slide. So will the sequence of returns really matter? I think this is the best way to express it. This comes from Moshe Malevsky, um, who's a professor up in Canada. And so uh, what he said was this, when you accumulate money, it's different from when you take it out. And so he shows it, and I think this is very simple. These are two portfolios. One has the bad year in the third year. The second one has the bad year in the second year. These two portfolios in accumulation mode, every three years they behave this way, they are equal. They, they grow at 8% each year. However, if you start taking money out with the uh, uh, um, Monte Carlo scenarios, what happens is the first one with the bad year in the third year runs out of money in the 30th year. And the second one with the bad year in the second year runs out of money 25 years. So that's where they're different. That's another risk. So if you retire like in 2000 or 2008, you start taking money out. It's a real problem. And, uh, and, and, and that's, uh, that's, that's an issue. Uh, next slide. Okay. So uh, this is something too, which I, I think everyone has to get used to this and begin to look at this thing. It's the idea of using a reverse mortgage as a Buffett asset. And actually this is something that Wade Fow did, you know, who was affiliated with the, uh, with the college. And so what he's showing here is a 30 year time horizon. So we're on the same page, right? And uh, he's looking at 1965 to 95. Why? He wanted to find time periods where you had early downturns, all right? So you start off with a $1 million balance in the S&P 500 with 4% annual withdrawal rate. You skip put portfolio withdrawals and down years of 67, 70, 74, and 75. So what he was showing here was the fact that, and that's where all of those lines are. If you did all of them, if you hit the, the it's not a trifecta, it's four, I don't know what that is. If you hit the quad, that $1 million would grow to $4 million while you're still taking money out. So what he's saying is that the fact of the matter is, is that going forward, things like people who have a lot of their, their, their net worth tied up in the house, they can use a reverse mortgage. Now, I know this is somewhat controversial, but they are getting better and there's going to be more. It's going to have to happen. When you have people living longer, the fact of the matter is, is they're going to need to, to be able to, 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 to access this money. And there's another benefit too, which I'll get to in a minute. Next slide. So one of the benefits of using a HECM is simply you can adjust withdrawals to performance and you avoid selling at a loss. If I can, sell, if I can keep the portfolio intact and allow the thing to grow, then you know, there you go. Uh, it reduces the sequence of return risk in the early years, especially. So I'm providing this money. Using a buffer asset, the HECM, for spending in, in market down, down years to preserve the portfolio. You reduce the risk of running out of money and Heckam should no longer be considered a last resort, but rather a coordinated effort strategy. And that was from Dr. Wade Fow. Also, it's not included as ordinary income at this stage of the game. So those are very important tools to be thinking about. Now, I know a lot of you can't do these yet, but I think over time, they're going to become more and more acceptable. And as, as Wade Fow says, you should no longer be considered as a last resort, but rather a coordinated stra uh, strategy. According to uh, according to Dr. Fow, something to keep in your mind and your head. Okay, next one, uh, the risk. Okay, purchasing power risk. Um, next slide. Um, a lot of times we use terms like inflation and what have you, and people don't really understand what you're talking about. So I like to use pictures. So here's two postage stamps. And again, we're going back 30 years, right? Because a, bear, a couple age 62 that doesn't smoke. 50% chance one of them's alive at, at, at 62 at age at age uh, 92, which is 30 years. So anyway, in 1991, a stamp cost 25 cents. In 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 2001, it cost 21. It cost 55 cents. That's up two and a half times. So next slide. How much does money have to grow to keep up with the 3% inflation? It's got to grow. Uh, uh, it's got to go to about $240,000 to keep, just to keep even. So if you take a look, next slide, in 1991, the stamp cost 25 cents 
and the S&P was 325 bucks. 2021, the stamp is 55 cents. Next slide, is 55 cents. And uh, the, the S&P opened the year at 3,700. That's over 10 times. That's 10 times. So that means that people in retirement need not only a lifetime income they can't outlive, they need a lifestyle sustaining income they can't outlive. And there's five ways to ensure keeping purchasing power intact. One is to invest in equities. That's a good way to go as long as you can handle the ups and downs. Next is invest in variable annuities that have income riders. Uh, the other one is invest in indexed annuities uh, to have some upside participation without downside risk. You don't get all of the upside, but you get a piece of it. You can also ladder immediate annuities contracts and use the mortality credits. And I'll get to that in a minute. And then find ways to minimize your taxable income. And for those who can't weather the emotional roller coaster of the equities market, they may want to consider an indexed annuity. Okay. Look, after all, inflation over the past 30 years has eroded purchasing power by two and a half times. So anything above two and a half times or 3% might be all one needs to keep their purchasing power and standard of living the same. So it's like the old story, you know, two guys in a forest and a bear starts running at them. And one guy says, we got to outrun the bear. And the other guy says, no, I just have to outrun you. All right. Next slide. What I want to show you is, again, this whole idea about uh, using... Um, uh, uh, mortality credits, and it's the idea of laddering immediate annuities. So what we have here is someone age 60, and they happen to have a half a million dollars. And so what they do at age 60 is they uh, is they take half of the money uh, to $250,000, and they put it into an immediate annuity, and it pays them $1,038 uh, a month for the rest of their life guaranteed, no matter what the market does, no matter what interest rates do, what have you. Then 10 years later at age 70, they take 60% of the original deposit, 150,000. And they take this 150,000 and they put it into an immediate annuity and it pays them $1,856, excuse, uh, excuse me, 800, an additional $818, which gives a total amount of $1,856. And then at age 80, 40%, which is only 100,000, they take 40% of the original deposit, put it into an immediate annuity. It pays them an additional $828 for $26.77. And so essentially what they've done is without any market risk or any interaction with the capital markets, they've allowed to, 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 to keep the purchasing power stable for the amount of income they were receiving uh, originally. The next slide shows this. This is life insurance planning. And this slide shows what happens with our progressive income tax system. As your taxable income increases, your taxes increase. Your social security benefits are reduced primarily from IRMA. You guys know what IRMA is? It ain't a lady. Income related monthly adjustment amount. See, Medicare is now means tested, meaning the more you make, the more of your social security check will simply pay Medicare premiums and then some. So if you're single and your retirement income is 87,000 or you're married and it's 174,000 or less, you pay a base Medicare premium. If you're between 136 and 163,000 a single or 272 and 536 as married, you pay 160% of the base Medicare premium. And if you're a single 163 to 500 or 326 to 750 uh, in, um, uh, uh, as a married couple, you pay 230% of your base Medicare premium. Minimizing one's taxable income is importantly, important, especially in light of other, other taxes rising. The other thing is you have to stand is the, the uh, cost of living, okay? The cost of living, right? The cost of living in 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 Medicare is going to go up 6.2 percent versus about 2.1 percent in, in 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 Social Security. That means, unfortunately, I guess someone like me, I will not receive in the future Social Security. And then they might ask me for more to pay for my Medicare. But I do have the benefit of being able to pay 85 percent taxes on that Social Security benefit I get. So it really Minimizing one's taxable income is important, especially in light 
of the possibility that regular taxes are going to go up. And I have a feeling that is. So what is, next slide, what is not considered taxable income? Health savings accounts, Roth accounts. Let me tell you what I did. I'm self-employed now. I have a SEP IRA. I'm not making any more contributions to it. I'll take the money I would have contributed and I pay taxes up front to get some of that money over into a Roth, making it tax-free. Hopefully I can do it again next year. I hope the Democrats can't get to the point of raising taxes next year, but you know they're gonna try their darndest. Just something to think about. So that's what Roth accounts really are. And it's something, a strategy that you guys should really be thinking about. Home equity mortgages, tax-free. Uh, and, and they could also be used for a social security bridge, right? Remember the person, you know, the 18 versus 28, they could take out a loan and, and make up the difference that way. Also comes out on a tax-free basis. That's why this is gonna be poor, become more important than I think Wayne Fowl, Wayne Fowl is, uh, is ahead of his time thinking about it. And the other thing is properly funded life insurance policies that are a non-MEC non can provide people with the tax-free income to help perhaps possibly lower lower their um, uh, their overall taxable income. And immediate annuities with non-qualified non money, there's an exclusion allowance. And that means that a good hunk of that money would come back to you tax-free. Next slide. So the other risk that people have is health risks. And next slide, you know, there's a What's the possibility of your house, you know, burning down is 3%, your car blowing up 18%, a long-term care incident is 72%. You really have to take care of that, whether you do it with some life policies that have those riders or long-term care itself. So look, I admire what you guys do, and I can think of no greater calling. You have the inside track to evolving uh, from, a, from, a, from a sales organization to a service organization. Uh, from just selling products to establishing relationships. So uh, look, we did the, I did the research. You know what I found out? Everyone dies. And that means you too. So what will matter is not what you bought, but what you built. What will matter is not what you got, but what you gave. What will matter is not your success, but your significance. What will matter is not what you learned, but what you taught. What will matter is not your competence, but your character. What we'll learn is every act of kindness and or sacrifice that enabled others to emulate your example. What will matter is not the number of people you knew, but the number of people have a lasting fear of loss when you're gone. What will matter is not your memories, but the memories of those who loved you. What will matter in the end is how long you're remembered, by whom and for what. Living a significant life is a choice, and you do it here. Because if you're able to provide for people's well-being, to have a retirement that they can't outlive, to make certain that, that a widow is taken care of or a family is taken care of, or that an illness, the bills are taken care of, that's something that's significant, and you'll be remembered forever. Next slide. So I talked about the idea of the four pillars. The third one was storytelling, and so I'd like to tell you my story. Some of you have heard it. But for those who don't, this is my mother, okay? On the left is Peggy, on the right is Marie. I have a brother, but this is about the girls. Uh, my father was an advisor to Harry Truman when he was president. In 1952, uh, he uh, cashed in a $100,000 New York life policy to buy an apartment building in the Bronx and he got killed in a car accident. My mother woke up with four kids. I'm six months old, Marie's 12, the two are in the middle and she had to take care of us. So she had no insurance. She had to go and find a job. She wasn't raised to be a professional person, but she finally found a job as a secretary in the bartender's local in the Bronx. Not exactly the White House for tea, was it? Um, the other thing is the Bronx where we lived was marvelous in the 50s, not very nice in the 70s. The worst decision my mother had to make was you see the two girls, neither one of them went to college at the appropriate age, even though one of them got a full scholarship. And my mother had to make the decision that the girls had to go to work to make sure the boys went to college. How do you like that decision? I was too young to figure out why my mother was crying, but can you imagine that? Let me tell you something. This is as alive today. I'm turning 70 this year is as alive today as it was back then. It's the consequences of the decisions that people get forced into that have to make. So anyway, um, that was my life. And I never used to use that story. Why? I, I didn't use it because, by the way, do you know what $100,000 US was in 1958? You could buy a kick-ass house for 8,000 bucks. You'd probably sell it for a quarter of a million dollars in 1980 when the inflation hit. Our lives would have been radically different. See, that, that was the point I missed. 
It's not about the math. It's about the consequences of the decision, how that life would have been easier for my mother, who I know died young because she had a pretty hard life. That's the impact. And I was I didn't know about it. And I would never use this story. Why? Because it's all about me. I wouldn't think it would be professional. And I also thought people would think I'm looking for sympathy. How stupid can you get? Stories are good. Personal stories are better. So anyway, let me tell you what happened to me. I walked into a meeting at MetLife. I'm a senior VP. I, uh, I, um, uh, 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 I wasn't particularly popular in a home office. And I sat down, there's like 50 people there. And someone said, uh, hey, you know what? Uh, what's he doing here? You know, the guy, he, he doesn't really partner very well. And sometimes he hurts my feelings. He can get obnoxious. And I, I, I plead guilty. And I was sitting there going, boy, what am I doing in this place? And then I started thinking about it. I said, you know, I've gotten this reaction from people a lot and I, I don't know where it comes from and why is that? And I would, I would have a feeling that I had to get something done and I would just do it. And I made sure that nothing got in my way, but I never asked the question why, and that's important. You got to know why you do what you do, because if you don't, people won't understand what your motives are. And that's what was happening to me, but I didn't know it at the time. So anyway, I'm sitting there and I'm saying, you know what? I don't know why this happens. Why am I in this position? You know, I'm, I'm speaking all over the world. MetLife isn't happy about it. They might even fire me, but for some reason, I feel I have to do this. And it came to me in an instant. I recognized for the first time that what I do, what I do, or my purpose is to make certain that I talk to the thousands to save the millions from the fate she had. That which I thought was a tragedy was a triumph. And in life, it's not the pain of the journey, it's the rapture of the revelation. So let me tell you this, you all have your own life, but I hope you sit back and think about the importance of what you do, the impact you have on, your, on, on, on others and just live a significant life. Thanks. Joe, that was terrific. You're fabulous as always, very enlightening. On behalf of the American College and especially the Alumni Association, I wanna thank everybody for their attendance today. As a reminder, uh, the college puts on a number of webcasts over the course of the year. You can sign up on our website at alumni.theamericancollege.edu slash events. <clears throat> and rather than show you a slide on that or review it again, suffice it to say that we have a wonderful alumni relations team. They're going to be sending out some material after this presentation that will be included. So. Thank you again for joining this webcast today. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And above all, be safe and God bless. Thank you. <laughs>